I would like to begin by thanking for uh, thanking you for organizing this. So thank you, Alex, for organizing the webinar and and development for um, giving us this opportunity to present our work. And also uh, thank you everyone for joining us today to uh, for, uh, discuss and attend my work on understanding the choreography of the human brain development. So a brief introduction, the brain development or in particular human brain development begins with the specification of a two dimensional tissue sheet or the neural plate, which forms some sort of a group. And this group then bends over to form a central luminal canal region and the top parts of the tissue then fuses on the dorsal side. And this results in the formation of a neural tube with a central uh, luminal region. Now uh, this three dimensional morphogenesis as this is happening, a lot of different morphogens are getting secreted from different parts of the developing brain or the developing embryo. And this ends up patterning the developing new neural tube into different distinct regional identities, such as the dorsoventral or rostrocaudal identity. So what actually happens is that morphogenesis and patterning are occurring together and influencing each other to form the developing brain, where now the anterior or the rostral regions of the brain has a large lumen and ends up forming the forebrain region. And as we move towards the uh, posterior sides with the midbrain becoming more uh, smaller with a smaller lumen or the hindbrain tapering further off with a further smaller lumen or a different tissue topology. Also in different regions of the brain, a lot of very specialized cell types are appearing, which all have very specific functions and also very distinct morphologies. An error in any of these processes in the morphogenesis patterning or cell type specification leads to a lot of diseases or neurodevelopmental disorders in, in humans. And the thing is, we know a lot about these processes from work done on mouse or zebra fish, fish or many primary model organisms. But really, the dynamics of understanding how morphogens, morphogenesis and patterning integrate this has remained quite elusive because I'm talking about events that happen from two to five weeks of the human pregnancy or the first few hours of mouse embryogenesis. So we cannot really access much of live tissue for these stages. So start understanding how these dynamic events are interacting with each other. So fortunately now in the last decade, with the advancement of human brain organoids, we can start culturing little pieces of uh, tissue in a dish. So what we do here is we can take some induced pluripotent stem cells or embryonic stem cells, and we aggregate them into embryoid bodies. So the protocol that I'm going to discuss for the rest of the talk, and also uh, you can see here in the slide, is an unguided brain organoid protocol, where we do not provide it any regional morphogen guidances. We rather let it self-pattern, where the embryoid body starts forming some sort of a neuroepithelium. And now over a period of two months or four months, it starts making these different tissue regions. So this is how the organoids would look in a dish. So there would be big tissue pieces in a cell culture dish. And if we take a cross section at two months, then as, as like the previous slide, the lumen I talked about, the organoids do start forming a lot of these lumen regions, which in fact show cell type orientation very similar to the primary tissue. So in this case, the ventral, ventricular side of the tissue forms progenitors and neuron starts appearing on the outer basal side um, of the developing organoid. Further, in the last decade, a lot of single cell atlases have been done and a lot of protocols have been uh, formed to form different brain region specific organoids or different approaches. And now work is done to combine these atlases all into one giant atlas and also compare it to single cell atlases of primary human brain tissue. And this has given us a very good understanding of what are the different cell types that emerge across different protocols and what are the regions or cell types that are still missing in the organoid tissues. Further, a lot of organoid disease models have been started uh, to, to be made. For example, uh, organoids for autism or microcephaly have been shown to be used. This making it really powerful for modeling human neurodevelopmental disorders or diseases in vitro. So now all of these studies have one limitation that they are based on snapshot technologies where we profile either with stainings or with single cell RNA-seq, what is the tissue status, but the dynamic understanding was still missing. So when I started my postdoc in Barbara Troitlein's group, there was this seminal single cell atlas done, which profiled organoids from zero day to up to four months. And they showed that using, using single cell uh, RNA-seq time course, they showed that initially there are these pluripotent stem cells which form the neurectoderm neuroepithelium regions, which around a month later start diverging into different brain specific lineages, such as dorsal and ventral telencephalic neurons, or also forming a lot of non telencephalic neurons. So the initial phase was the progenitors, which then start patterning into the different brain regions. 
However, the big black box now was this initial one month where now I asked the questions of how are stem cells creating this diversity of different uh, cell types completely in a self-organized, self-patterning manner? And also, what is the spatial organization of these different cells? So how are these different cells appearing in different parts of the organoid? So to do that, the first real challenge was that neural tissue is a very difficult tissue to image. I'm talking about human brain organoids, so they follow roughly human developmental times. It's really slow. I'm talking about one month that we wanted to image in one go. It was very large in size. It was easily one to three millimeters big tissue pieces that we were growing. The tissue is very optically dense, so we cannot really see through the tissue. And this is a cell culture system. So we wanted sterile and stable uh, culture conditions in a microscope. So we adapted a very specific inverted light sheet micro microscope, and we also worked a lot with the protocol to start making these organoids one uh, sparsely and mosaic labeling. So we are now mixing a lot of GFP and RFP label in a large population of unlabeled cells to make these sparse and mosaic cells. I started making the organoids smaller, and then with this inverted light sheet, we adapted the sample chamber to be able to profile 16 different organoids in one go with also partitions. So you can have a control condition and three uh, perturbations in one experiment. So the other thing that I did was to make these organoid not, not just mosaic, but multi-mosaic. What I mean here is normally when we have any cell types or any imaging opportunities, the protein would be either GFP tagged or RFP tagged. So similarly, I had cell lines which had an actin or a histone tag in GFP or a membrane tubulin or lamin tag in RFP. But if you really look at it, all of these are different subcellular structures. So now if we mix them up and start making a multi-mosaic organoid, then in one neuroepithelium by eye as humans, we can distinguish a tubulin labeled cells versus a lamin labeled cell because these are structurally very different. In between the empty spaces are unlabeled cells, which so sparse labeling again. So with this uh, approach, now we could make these organoids where in every region, you could now profile multiple different subcellular structures in one experiment instead of imaging two uh, GFP RFP combinations over several experiments. So I'm really happy to show you this movie here. This particular organoid was then imaged for a bit over a week where you can see how the entire dynamics are transitioning. You see a lot of lamin label cells moving around here you see some sort of interkinetic nuclear migrations and cell divisions with histones. And the big portion here is all tubulin labeled cells, which are transitioning from very small, initially stem cell-like cells to becoming really elongated, because that is also something very specific to this tissue, where shape can also indicate the identity of the cell. Another example is this little movie on the right, where there is a specific reporter for a brain region, the medial ganglionic eminence. And this particular imaging we have done for three weeks straight every hour, where you can start seeing a region emerge, but also a lot of cell movements, um, cell movements from different parts of the organoid as the cells start to migrate. So this ends up now being 16 parallel positions we image multiple subcellular labels in one experiment, and also three weeks of stable imaging, creating a lot of data. So about 24 terabytes of data per experiment. I'm not going to discuss how we do the data mining here, but very happy to take that afterwards if, some, if somebody uh, is curious about how we are doing the data analysis side. So now, as I said, we had 16 positions, right? So here you are seeing all 16 organoids, which are imaged in one, uh, one experiment. And you're looking at cross sections where the reds are the segmented lumen regions as they appear over time. So you might have heard that organoids are a bit infamous for being very heterogeneous, and you can observe that indeed the 16 organoids look very different from each other. So it's true that the morphology is not looking very similar, but then we started quantifying some parameters such as luminal volumes, number of lumens, total organoid growth parameters, and we found very surprisingly that despite the obvious heterogeneity, if you really quantify the growth parameters, they are very consistent. So almost around the same time, all organoids have the same, same peak lumen number, or all organoids follow a very similar profile of lumen volume changes over time. So this indicated to us that underlying this big morphology probably there is some gene uh, regulation that's going on. For this, we coupled our analysis to single cell RNA-seq. We did a time course for these stages, and we found that the early, uh, early organoid cells, so when we start this imaging before the lumen formation, are largely corresponding to early neurectoderm, which transition into a late neurectoderm over time. This switch corresponds to where the peak lumen number starts changing. And in fact, it's a gene expression switch. So very different genes, which are all stem cell related genes, they are express expressing in the first few days. And this now switches 
to more prosencephalic progenitors, etc. And when we do a gene ontology analysis, we found that a lot of terms that come up, so a lot of these genes which are going up after this big morphological change, they belong to the extracellular matrix category. So uh, collagen secretion, ECM secretion, et cetera. So normally when we are growing these organoids, we embed them in an extracellular matrix, which is matrigel. This is a mouse sarcoma derived basement membrane. Now, extracellular matrix is known to provide structural stability to tissues. It also provides polarization to the tissue. So there is an apicopacic polarity that emerges. It can be loaded with many growth factors and different kind of proteins that interact with the tissue. Our analysis showed that the organoids are also starting to secrete a lot of extracellular matrix. So to test for this, we grew them the normal way, as I showed before, where we have the ECM provided externally in the form of matrigel, and we see the lumen behaviors and the, you can see the segmentations as well. But then we also made them without any extracellular matrix to just have them secrete any, any matrix. And then to capture what is getting secreted, we provided a very low percentage agarose to just now try to give some sort of a structural hold and see whether the organoid can self-polarize itself. And now very interestingly, we found that unlike matrigel, in the absence, a lot of smaller lumen appear, which never really fuse. And when you have the agarose condition, some lumens start fusing, starting to make one big giant lumen, which is very reminiscent of how the matrigel condition looks. So we went further in, and now we tried, we segmented the cells, and we looked at the alignment of these cells over time. So what we did here is, for each individual cell, how perpendicular is it to the surface of the organoid? And the red color corresponds when it's very perpendicular. So here you can see that in presence of matrigel, almost all these uh, cells start uh, reacting to the matrix very fast and they start becoming perpendicular. But when you don't have it, almost all the cells are lying in all sorts of parallel, anti-parallel orientations, and they are just randomly oriented in the tissue. Whereas in case of agarose, it's again slightly better, where some cells show these alignments. So what alignment could mean in terms of cell polarity, we stained for many different ECM markers. This is an example here where you can see collagen in orange. And we found that in presence of matrigel, there is a very uh, strong and clean basement membrane organization that happens around the tissue. So there is this very nicely aligned, uh, aligned extracellular matrix that forms when you provide it externally. But if we don't give it, then the tissue has mixed polarity. So sometimes the ECM is getting secreted on uh, these middle parts, it's never really on the outside. So sometimes the apical part is facing the lumen here where the arrow is, but sometimes it's also on the outside. So this tissue is unlike now the tissue which was grown with metrics. It in fact has all sort of apical orientations in different parts of the organoid. So now to really understand what is happening at the cellular level over time, we took these multi-mosaic label organoids and we developed a whole image analysis pipeline using different kinds of tools, especially deep learning uh, based um, image segmentation and demultiplexing. And we, what we did, we segmented all of the cells in the organoid. And now we formed some sort of a classifier to assign cells to the five different labels. So starting from two channel imaging, digitally, we could make it a five channel reconstruction. And then we could do this for our entire movies over time. So using these segmentations, so uh, I, I didn't say this. So to be able to segment these, what we did is a measurement called as morphometrics, where we took about 20 to 30 measurements of cell area, cell volume, cell elongations, curvatures, et cetera. And now using this information about cell shapes, we divide all of the cells into distinct clusters. So each of this color uh, corresponds to a single cluster which is all the cells which share similar shape identities. And here in the U map, each dot is a single cell. So when we do this analysis, we find that, okay, we, there are about eight clusters that appear in these morphotypes. So eight different morphologically similar clusters. And this now changes over time. So the cluster two, for example, which is more yellow cluster is also earlier in time. And over time, these more rounded, initial uh, yellow clusters uh, start transitioning into more cyan clusters, which are now these more elongated cells. So this is kind of the transition that is happening in the organoid. And we, when we compare different ma uh, matrix uh, con uh, conditions, we find that in presence of matrigel, the yellow clusters just completely start becoming smaller. So there is a very nice transition where now the blue cyan clusters are increasing over time. So the elongated morphotypes are increasing. But in absence, when the no matrix condition is, is there, a lot of these yellow cell types persist and something similar or in between happens with the agarose. So this made us ask, 
what is really happening at the organoid patterning level? What are these cells and what are the yellow cells that are persisting? So to answer this question, we went back to the end of our imaging and we did another single cell RNA-seq experiment to classify the different cell types that are emerging across these three conditions. And what you just need to pay attention is to these three progenitors that come up in the uh, organoids. And we found that when we have the externally provided matrigil, not only the polarities and the morphologies are different, these organoids are largely forming telencephalic progenitors. But when we don't have it, a lot of deencephalic progenitors and a lot of neural crest cells start coming up in the no matrix organoids. And Agarose shows again an in-between situation where it starts making both, both the kinds of deencephalic and telencephalic progenitors. So one of our top differentially expressed genes in this analysis was Wintless. Wintless is wind ligand -like secretion mediator. So it's required for secretion of wind proteins. And it is very well known that winds are very involved in caudalizing of the developing embryo or caudalizing of the developing brain. So when we stained for it, we did find that windless is really high in these organoids, which were never exposed to any matrix. Now to understand how this matrix change and tissue morphology change could be linked to the tissue patterning, we went and we looked at YAP. YAP is a very, very well-studied known mechanotransducer, which is involved in sensing the extracellular matrix microenvironment, but also the density in the tissue and the uh, mechanical properties of the tissue. So it was known that in mouse cardiac progenitors, uh, YAP1 is directly upregulating windless. So we also stained for YAP1 in our organoids, and we found that it is indeed very high in the no matrix organoids. We also did a cut and tag experiment and we found that YAV1 does bind to the windless promoter regions where in neural tissue as well, it could be upregulating the windless expression. So then we did our light shield uh, movies again and we found that when we give a YAP activator, although these organoids have made these big luminal structures very similar to the matrigial control condition, upon activation of YAP, they start collapsing and they start becoming very rounded, which in fact now looks like uh, no matrix organoids in morphology. So we did a single cell RNA seq of these activator exposed organoids, and we found that in the in the black region where the YAP activator has been given, windless is indeed very high in these these regions. And now, if you look at the identity of these cells, they are non-telencephalic as well. So now, upon YAP activation, windless was high in the organoids, and now these are starting to pattern to the non-telencephalic regions of the brain. So to finally uh, close this side, what we did, we developed a new windless knockout IPSC line, and we give different kinds of treatments to this line. We grew it with matrix, no matrix, YAP activator, wind inhibition, et cetera. And we did a single cell RNA-seq experiment. And what we found, so you just need to look at this most important part here, where in the control condition, if you activate wind or you give a YAP activator, a lot of non-telencephalic regions come up. So similar to our activator experiments now, Control always starts patterning to different brain regions upon this exposure, but in the knockout, it starts to remain largely telencephalic now, even uh, in, uh, largely telencephalic even upon wind activation or YAP activation in the absence of any windless, it doesn't form these posterior regions. So to summarize, by using light sheet microscopy based this long-term imaging and cell, cell level and tissue level analysis and combining it with single cell transcriptomics, what we found is that upon exposure to an external matrix environment, the cells align and polarize to form a neurectoderm, which transitions into a neural tube region that's make, that makes big luminal regions and largely patterns to the telencephalic regions of the brain. Whereas in the absence, YAP becomes very high, YAP and hippo signaling becomes very high in the organoid, upregulating the windless expression. And this now leads to a different region of the patterning. So this now starts creating a lot of neural, neural crest cells, but also it starts making the organoid pattern towards more deencephalic mid hindbrain regions with a smaller lumen, which doesn't fuse and has a very different tissue topology compared to the matrigel exposed organoids. So where now this goes next, what we have started to do is now track these cells, so track these morphotypes over time. So this is just a glimpse of something very recent that we have started doing. We are now dragging all these morphotypes over time to quantify parameters such as cell division events, where on the top, this uh, the blinking movie is every new cell division, which on the bottom movie you can see as a color transition. So every time a cell division event happens, the cells are getting a newer color. Similarly, on the lights, right side, we are tracking these. Sure, we need to wrap up if you don't mind. Sorry. Yeah. We're Sorry, how long has it been? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, this is the last slide. Okay. And further, we are tracking these lineages to understand how morphotypes are changing 
uh, across the uh, lineage tree in these organoids. So with that, I would like to thank a lot of people, especially Barbara and Gray, and especially Jill, who is the co-pilot of this project and has been driving all the light sheet image analysis side. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'll read out one question. We're a little behind, so just uh, go. we'll just have the one question. Uh, so it comes from somebody who's anonymous, and they ask, thanks for your talk. In your video, it looked like different reporter cells were localized to different domains in the organoids. Is this an artifact of the cell mixing process, or do the cell types in those domains have a specific cellular architecture that's reflected in differences uh, in the expression of the reporters? Yeah. So this actually depends a bit from organoid to organoid. We are mixing them very well, but upon addition of matrigel, this starts polarizing very fast and making a neuroepithelium. So sometimes if there is an initial bias with cell division, it just expands with that particular color in one region. But there are also parts of the organoid which are always very well mixed. We have not found a direct correlation of individual label to any particular cell type forming. We have tested for that. And when we do these stainings, we find that okay, different parts of the organoid might be going towards different brain regions, but this is a bit independent of the cell mixing. Okay, thanks very much again.